Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for coming uh, in person and those who are connected. Uh, we are going to record this presentation so those who are not here, they can watch it online. And well, this is the first presentation of a lecture series called Faith, uh, Reason, and Beauty. And we have the honor to uh, to have Dustin Barbary with us. He's from the, uh, the English department. Uh, he's a senior lecturer at the English department. And I can say many good things about Justin, uh, but because of the time, I'm gonna say three things. <laughs> One is that uh, Justin has the ability to connect different disciplines. So he's not only expert in literary studies, but he also connects theology, philosophy, Every time you talk with Justin, you learn a lot of thing, new things. Uh, the second thing is that uh, he also has the ability to explain very difficult concepts with simple words. Uh, this is why all his students love him. Uh, he's not only passionate and kind, but also he has the ability to explain difficult things. And finally, uh, before coming to UNG, Justin uh, taught in different universities in other states, but also in other countries, in Korea and Costa Rica. And also half of his family is from Korea. So he has a very global perspective uh, on different topics. So that's that makes him very interesting. So, uh, so please uh, just give him an applause and join me in welcome you. <laughs> Thank you, Justin. <laughs> Thanks, Alfredo. Uh, really nice introduction. And uh, yeah, I want to thank Alfredo because he was really the mastermind behind this group um, that we started reading literature, um, looking at it through different lenses and a lens of faith. Um, and it's kind of out of that group that this series has uh, really started. So I'm honored to be the first one uh, to go and give this a go. And I'm glad you're here. Whether you were curious to be here or not, I'm glad you're here. Happy Friday, happy noon. Uh, and to talk about one of those difficult things that that, that um, was mentioned, like how do we explain difficult things in an easy, to fash uh, easy fashion? I hope that I can do that today because it's a difficult question to think about how the idea of violence can somehow be existent with what we would consider a Christian aspect of faith. And that's really what we're going to be looking at today uh, in O'Connor's work. So I want to talk a little bit about O'Connor's life, just kind of give you an arc of her story. She's a Georgia female writer, so we get to be celebrating her during this month of uh, women's awareness and uh, our own native Georgian. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm calling the two-eyed approach or an anagogical reading, and I know that's really jargony literary term. But anagogical means looking at something in two different ways. One, looking at the concrete observable reality, like the realism of a system, and looking at what might be happening on a more spiritual or mysterious side. Um, so we're going to look at three different things. One, O'Connor's aesthetic vision. That just means her art, her attitudes about fiction, and her moral vision, which is going to come from her uh, Catholicism and her deep faith. Manners is realism. Manners is how people act and interact with one another and interact with their environment. But how does mystery play into those things? And then, of course, violence and grace. So all of these things are kind of in tension with one another. But O'Connor, I think, in her work, helps synthesize mm -hmm. these things. And then we'll apply this type of reading to the work Revelation, which is a short story. Uh, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It's one of my favorites. And then we'll uh, go into some questions and discussion. First, I want to just give you a quick story, give you a little um, idea about O'Connor, who she was. Very humorous person. Um, she was 27 years old. She had just published her first novel, Wise Blood. Um, and it was a wild, crazy, weird, dark, grotesque novel. Um, and she was at a gathering in Nashville, Tennessee, and there was a man who had just read her novel. And he was he was he heard that she was going to be there, so he was really excited to meet the mind out of which 
such a dark novel had come out of. And he's introduced to this woman who's petite. She's sweet-faced. She has this really thick Southern accent. And he, he looks confused. And he's like looking her up and down. And he's like, that was a profound novel. You don't look like you wrote it. And O'Connor says that she worked up her greatest snarl and looked at him real mean and said, well, I did. And that gives us a sense of who O'Connor was. And even she admitted that maybe she didn't look the part. Maybe it was an unexpected package out of which such pulverizing, scandalous, grotesque characters can come from and yet be overridden by a sense of mystery. This was Flannery O'Connor. Flannery O'Connor was born in uh, Savannah, Georgia in 1925. <clears throat> Her parents were Edward O'Connor and Regina Klein. Edward was a vet. He um, tried to make his way in the real estate business in Savannah at the time. Regina was from more genteel stock. Uh, she had family of landowners, even a mayor, Peter Klein of Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, they lived in this neighborhood in Savannah, <clears throat> surrounded by people like them, Catholics, Irish Catholics. Uh, so her entire childhood was brought up in the Catholic Church. Her family went to Mass every single day, and this would be a practice that O'Connor would continue uh, through the rest of her life. Her father was a very doting father. Her mom was a very strong mother, um, and those she was the only child, so she was given uh, great care under the ages of both of these. Um, O'Connor admits that she was a pretty precocious child, as you can see in the image on the left. She was also a voracious reader. We always want to know, like, what were the reading habits of great literary people? She was a voracious reader, but she said she read primarily slop with a capital S, meaning she read nothing serious when she was a young kid, uh, except for the humorous tales of Edgar Allan Poe. And she writes this, that these were mighty humorous. One about a young man who was too vain to wear his glasses and consequently married his grandmother by accident. Another about the fine figure of a man who in his room removed wooden arms, wooden legs, hairpiece, artificial teeth, voice box, et cetera, et cetera. Another about the inmates of a lunatic asylum who take over the establishment and run it to suit themselves. This is an influence I would rather not think about. And yet for us as readers of O'Connor's work, we can certainly see how maybe these stories of Edgar Allan Poe would plant seeds that would grow into O'Connor's own unique uh, vision of the grotesque in her own work. Um, Edward, her father, uh, during the Depression era, his real estate business didn't go so well, so he has to find a job elsewhere. So he gets a job in um, uh, Atlanta, working for the Federal Housing Authority. Uh, Regina and Flannery lived in Atlanta for exactly one year, but hated it, didn't like Atlanta. Um, so they decided to move to Milledgeville to be with Regina's sisters. Um, and this is the house that they lived in. This is called the Klein Mansion. Um, if you're ever in downtown Milledgeville, that's what it looks like, it's still there. Uh, and Flannery's family still lives in that house. Um, Edward would work in Atlanta, come to Milledgeville on the weekends, and he would he would do that, and that would kind of be the system for like the first three years of their life in Milledgeville. But then Edward got sick. He came down, got really, really sick, got a battery of tests, and it was found that he had the disease lupus, which in that day was basically a death sentence, and he would die three years later at the age of 45. So it would, be re it would be Flannery and her mother and her sisters uh, living in this house for most of um, Flannery's adolescent life. Um, she went to high school in Milledgeville, and she has this to say about her education there. She says, I am blessed with total non-retention, meaning she didn't remember anything from high school, uh, which means I have not been harmed by a very uh, by a sorry education, or that is my cheerful way of doing it. So we can kind of see her her sarcasm uh, at, at play here, but also a kind of anti-authoritarian streak. Um, she didn't like to be told how to write or how to act ladylike or do any of these things. And it's probably for that reason that she didn't major in English in college, because she was probably told, if you're going to be a lady writer, you have to write like a lady. 
Uh, so instead, she goes to college in Mill Milledgeville, the Georgia College for Women, and majors in social studies. She wasn't really a recluse, but she didn't do a whole lot to like ingratiate herself to, to girls or boys in high school. Um, but she was very busy. She was working on the school newspaper and uh, writing stories for the paper. And she, um, her main focus was on cartooning and then doing journalistic work. And you can kind of get a sense here of her humor at work as well. The one on the left says, wake me up in time to clap at an assembly. Uh, this is a student in the library. Do you have any books the faculty doesn't particularly recommend? And then do you think that teachers are necessary? So again, they kind of reflect her, her humor and her idea about her education that was, she was receiving. But it was in college that she met a philosophy pro professor. And even though the philosophy professor said that O'Connor didn't believe a word of what he was saying, he recognized something about O'Connor and he became a kind of mentor that um, influenced her to apply for graduate school uh, in the field of journalism in Iowa. And she did, she applied, she sent her cartoons, she sent some of her writing, she gets into graduate school in Iowa. We don't know really what happened in that first week in Iowa, but it was three or four days she was on campus. She walks into the uh, office of Paul Engel, who was the director of the Iowa Writers Workshop. It was a first of its kind MFA program for writing, very prestigious place. In fact, I think at last count, there was 29 Nobel Prizes for literature that come out of this. And she just waltzes in, shows him some of her work, and she's in somehow. So, you know, the uh, bureaucracy of getting into school and changing majors wasn't what it was, uh, or what was it what it is now, perhaps. But there she is. She's in the Iowa Writers Workshop, surrounded by writers who care about their craft. Um, and she uh, spends her time there writing five short stories that she does for her master's thesis. One of those stories would ultimately become her first novel, Wise Blood. It was also during this time that we get this really unique glimpse into the life of O'Connor. Um, this was actually found in the year 2000 and then published in 2013, almost 50 years after her death. But it's a prayer journey. Um, when she was 20 years old in Iowa, she would write things in her journal. And it was published in 2013 as a prayer journal. But I just want to give you a couple of entries here. Please let Christian principles permeate my writing. I dread, O oh Lord, losing my faith. My mind is not strong. It is prey to all sorts of intellectual quackery. Don't let me ever think, dear God, that I was anything but an instrument for your story. Oh, dear God, I want to write a novel, a good novel. I do not know you, God, because I am in the way. Please help me to push myself aside. We see two things at work here. One, we see her deep, profound desire to be a writer and to be a good writer and to be a writer that matters. But we also see this profound and mature vision of her own faith and what she wants to do. Um, after Iowa, she goes to Yaddo. This is an uh, artist colony. She gets a grant to go there. She gets an advance on her book. She's a young writer. Things are going really well for her. She lives in New York City for like a hot minute, but you know, they couldn't, they didn't like Atlanta when she was a teenager. She's certainly not going to like New York. Um, so she's there for a little while, but she goes to live with some friends in Connecticut kind of the perfect situation. They're, they live in the woods in Connecticut, but they're not too far from the literary epicenter of the states, New York City. Um, she lives with a, a very literary family. They're also very devout Catholics as well. So it's the perfect space for her to work on her novel um, and think about her writing career. So everything seems to be going perfectly. Then she decides to travel to Georgia to visit family. She gets sick on the train. And by the time she got off the train, uh, her uncle said that she looked like, quote, a shriveled old woman. And her family was in shock. They took her to get a battery of tests. They went to Emory. And it was concluded that she had the same disease that her father had, lupus. Although her mom wouldn't tell her for she didn't find out for 17 months that she actually had lupus. Her mom told her that she had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, 
something that mimics lupus, but her mother didn't think that she would be able to handle it. Here she was on the precipice of her adult life, this great career perhaps, and then she has this basic death sentence of a lupus disease. She writes that sickness is a place. She says, I've never been anywhere but sick. In a sense, sickness is a place more instructive than a long trip to Europe. And it's always a place where there's no company, where nobody can follow. Sickness before death is a very appropriate thing. And I think that those that don't have it miss one of God's mercies. So she came to have, we don't want to romanticize her illness, but she came to see it, I think, as a kind of blessing. Um, she would try to go back to Connecticut, try to resume her life as the expatriate writer, but she just kept getting sick. So it was finally decided that she would live with her mother in Milledgeville, and they would move out to the Klein uh, working farm. This is called Andalusia. Got a funny story about that with, uh, with Alfredo. Um, but I went here a few weeks ago. It still looks exactly the same as it did uh, in O'Connor's time. And she would live out the remainder of her life here, which would be about 14 years. She would publish two novels, um, 32 short stories in that short time. But here she was, right? This great writer confined to the rural South, surrounded by not intellectuals and great thinkers, but good country people, right? Her mom living with her mother. I'm sure this wasn't the vision that she had for her life. And yet she managed to turn this place into her writer's haven. And that's why we got so many great stories out of O'Connor, really drawing from this place at Andalusia. So it's a very special place. One of her later stories is called Parker's Back. And it's about a man who has tattoos all over his body. And he kind of treats his body like a shrine. And he's able to admire the tattoos that he has. The one place he doesn't have a tattoo is on his back. That's the name of the story, Parker's back. He doesn't have it on his back because he can't see it. He, he doesn't think you should have a tattoo on your back because you can't admire it. You can't look at it. Um, he also finds that the tattoos have a way with the opposite sex. He becomes a bit of a womanizer. Women are drawn to his tattooed body. But then he meets a girl, Sarah Ruth, who hates his tattoos. And she, he says that she's not pretty, she doesn't have a good personality, but he wants her because she doesn't like his tattoos. So he convinces her to marry him. She still hates his tattoos. She turns off the light when they get undressed and have sex. She's having nothing to do with his tattoos. So he hatches this brilliant idea. He's going to go get one tattoo on one place on his body. He doesn't have it, his back. But he's says it's got to be a big religious tattoo, and that's going to be the thing that's going to make Sarah Ruth submit to me. It's going to bring her to heal. She's finally going to, to uh, understand the power of my tattoos. So he goes to the tattoo artist, flipping through a book, sees this image of an icon of Christ. And he's like, that's, that's too weird. That, I can't do that. Flips the page, feels this compulsion to go back to the tattoo, flips away from it again, feels the compulsion to go back to the tattoo. Finally, he's like, this is the one. This is not the one that he chose. He felt like it was being chosen for him, but he gets it on his back. He has this tattoo on his back, and even though he can't see it, he has the feeling that it can see him and see into him. Um, so Parker fights it. He goes to the bar, gets really drunk, gets in a fight, goes home to Sarah Ruth. Sarah Ruth doesn't submit to him. She beats him over the back with a broomstick. Parker goes out under a tree and cries. Sarah Ruth didn't submit to him, but he ultimately submits to the Christ that is on his back. And I like this image. What's What do you notice about this image? This is the uh, sixth century icon of Christ the Pantocrator. What do you notice like right off the bat when you look at it? No one? Mm -hmm. Does anything stand out? His eyes. His eyes. Yes. Many people have like tried to figure out why are the eyes different, right? They and they are pronouncedly different. Did the artist do this intentionally, right? Uh, and some say it represents like the divinity of Christ and the humanity of Christ. 
or the way that Christ sees like one in concrete observable reality, the other in the spiritual world, right? These eyes can see everything that's going on. I like this image, the way it appears in the story, because I think the eyes of Owen Parker's back make sense, but I think it can also help us look at uh, O'Connor's work in the short story in, in a way. So one, the aesthetic vision and the moral vision, which we talked about. Two, mystery and manners. Three, violence and grace. The two-eyed approach. So first we're going to start with aesthetic vision and moral vision. Four main points here. O'Connor says that the artist's only concern is in creating art. That means that the artist only purpose is to create art and create good art and that it shouldn't have any kind of agenda or propaganda value alongside of it. Uh, art that begins with a moral or utilitarian and fails to be art. In other words, if you start with the idea, like I want to get my readers to think this or my uh, audience to, to feel this way, it's going to ultimately fail to be art. That art comes from the whole person of the artist, a holistic vision of who the artist is, not just as the creator, but as a whole person. And that a moral vision cannot then be separate from the art. Okay? Explaining that, breaking it down, one, you can't start with the moral, but at the end, there will be a moral or a thesis because of who the artist is. Right? For example, if you read a book by Kafka, Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Uh, this is a great existentialist text, right? But Kafka doesn't start out trying to write an existential novel, according to this theory. It's just because he is an existentialist that those existential themes come out through uh, his novel. So let's break that down. So this is O'Connor writing. She says, the novel is an art form, and when you use it for anything other than art, you pervert it. I didn't make this up. I got it from St. Thomas, via Maritain, who allows that art is wholly concerned with the good of that which is it, it is made. It has no utilitarian end. If you do manage to use it successfully for social, religious, or other purposes, it is because you make it art first. And that key word is art first. The artist must create art. She calls her type of work. She doesn't like labels and she doesn't like techniques and things like that, but she ultimately calls her work Christian realism. She says that this has become necessary for me. One of the awful things about writing when you're a Christian is that for you, the ultimate reality is the incarnation. The present reality is the incarnation and nobody believes in the incarnation. That is nobody in your audience. My audience are the people who think God is dead. So she's writing in a way which that concrete reality is going to be one in which a secular audience is going to be able to accept in some ways. It has to be real. Um, the actions have to be believable. The reader has to accept what is happening in the story. But as a whole person, O'Connor is writing from the vantage point of a Catholic who has what she calls a larger vision of reality. This is uh, Jacques Maritain, he's a French Catholic philosopher, but he writes about art uh, in this way. He says, do not make the absurd attempt to disasso disassociate in yourself the artist and the Christian. They are one, but apply only the artist to the work, precisely because the artist and the Christian are one. The work will derive wholly from each of them. And again, this gets back to the whole person of the artist, the one that's creating the art, that art is going to have a kind of thesis because the artist is creating. So if you think about it, the creation is going to reflect something um, essential about the creator themselves, what they believe, what they think is good, true, beautiful, etc. So this, you cannot take apart like what someone believes to be fundamentally true and then the art that they create. That's the argument that is being made here. But again, you don't start with what you think is true and try to make art around that. You start with the art and the truth comes out through that. Um, 
O'Connor writes that it makes a great difference to a novel whether its author believes that the world came in, came late into being and continues to come by a creative act of God, or whether he believes that the world and ourselves are the product of a cosmic accident. So again, there's this kind of thesis that's at the bottom of a work. So if the artist is like a postmodern or a humanist or an existentialist, then that vision is going to come out through their art. If the artist is a believer, a Christian or a Catholic or any other religious um, type, then that vision is going to come out through the work as well. So the moral vision is going to be inseparable from the artistic vision. Trying to set them apart would be like trying to tear meat from the bone, right? They belong together. The structure is there. This gets into matters and mystery. So O'Connor calls herself a realist, right? She writes Christian realism. That means writing, writing in a way that can be accepted as natural. So there's three points here. Realism means writing about the natural world, the mundane, in an unvarnished, concrete way. The natural world is going to include characters, actions, thoughts, physical spaces, the environment, et cetera. So how do you write about mystery if you are a realist? This is going to be the thing that O'Connor synthesizes. Mystery, we could call that the transcendent, the divine. It must appear, if at all, only from the action in the natural world. And I'm going to show you an example from our text um, that does that. She writes that the more a writer wishes to make the supernatural apparent, right, the natural, the supernatural, the more real he has to be able to make the natural world. For if the readers don't accept the natural world, they'll certainly not accept anything else. And then she goes on. When fiction is made according to its nature, it should reinforce our senses of the supernatural by grounding them in concrete, observable reality. That's the realism that she's talking about. Let's take a look at one passage from um, Revelation. She looks straight in front of her through Mrs. Turpin and on through the yellow curtain and the plate glass window, which made the wall behind her. The girl's eyes seem lit all of a sudden with a peculiar light, an unnatural light like night road signs gave. Mrs. Turpin turned her head to see if there was anything going on outside, but she could not see anything. Figures passing cast only a pale shadow through the curtain. Now, if we look at this carefully, this is a, a vision that we as the reader can accept as in concrete, observable reality. There's nothing here that we might not observe in life. Okay, so thinking about it, uh, we might see a plate glass window, we might see a curtain, we might see shadows moving on the other side because that's the way light reflects through a window and that's the way the eye can see shadows through a curtain. There's nothing strange going on here, right? Nothing mysterious, except if we're trying to see through two different eyes, we might be invited to see a little bit deeper. So look, one, the, the yellow curtain in the plate glass window, which made the wall behind her. The girl's eyes seemed lit all of a sudden with a peculiar light. They seemed like it was. And this is operational in realist text. You can't say they were, because that would be bringing the supernatural directly into the work. But it seemed lit all of a sudden with a peculiar light. Um, and then Mrs. Turpin turned her head to see if there was anything going on outside, but she could not see anything. Of course, you can't see through a plate glass window and a curtain, right? But we're invited to think about it a little bit deeper. Look at the, uh, the blue highlight here. The girl's eyes seen lit all of a sudden with a peculiar light, an unnatural light like night road signs gave. The anagogical reader is invited to go further, right? Maybe it seems like they're like that, but we're invited to think maybe they actually are. Maybe they, there is an unnatural light in Mary Grace's eyes. Um, figures passing cast only a pale shadow through the curtain. We're invited to think maybe Ruby Turpin's physical inability to see reflects kind of internal or spiritual inability to see. 
much like Plato's prisoners in, in Plato's cave, where they they can only see shadows on the wall and they're not getting a full picture of Plato's reality. So this kind of mystery and manners works together to ground the mysterious in observable action. And I think she's a master at this, and this is what makes her so unique. She writes that the role of the fiction writer is concerned with mystery that is lived with ultimate mystery as we find it embodied in the concrete world of sense experience. He will inevitably suggest that image of ultimate reality as it can be glimpsed in some aspect of the human situation. So Connor is concerned with this two-eyed vision of the world, an ultimate reality, not just seeing through our limited sense perceptions, but perhaps seeing with the extrasensory of her Catholic faith. We'll look at that. Finally, we get to what we want to talk about, right? What does violence have to do with grace? Here's what O'Connor says. Violence isn't an end in itself. That's the first point. Violence reveals who we are essentially. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. And violence prepares us for our, quote, moment of grace. This is the term that she uses. O'Connor's readers often misunderstood what she was trying to do. This was one of the things that she humorously wrote about, talked about. Um, but there was kind of two camps we could put her readers in. One is the secular camp, and the other is the religious camp. And both kind of missed what she was doing. Um, she says that uh, everybody who has ever read Wise Blood thinks I'm a hillbilly nihilist, whereas I would like to create the impression that I'm a hillbilly Thomist. In other words, a follower of Thomas Aquinas. She says, the stories are hard, but they are hard because there is nothing harder or less sentimental than Christian realism. I believe that there are many rough beasts now slouching toward Bethlehem to be born and that I have reported the progress of a few of them. And when I see these stories described as horror stories, I'm always amused because the reviewer always has hold of the wrong horror. So keep that phrase in your mind, the wrong horror. The horror that we're naturally going to look at in a story that has a violent scene is going to be the violence itself. But O'Connor thinks that that's the wrong horror that we are going to uh, be grabbing onto. A lot of her readers thought that she was like perfectly fit into the Southern Gothic um, character, right? People like Carson McCullers or Erskine Caldwell, even William Faulkner, right? These, these writers who would write about violence, they would write about grotesque characters, um, freaks, Southern degeneracy. This was kind of the Southern Gothic. And you can't blame readers for lumping O'Connor into the same camp because she does a lot of the same moves as they do. And this freaked out a lot of her religious re readers as well. Um, she writes that we Catholics are very much given to the instant answer. Fiction doesn't have any. It leaves us like Job with a renewed sense of mystery. St. Gregory wrote that every time the sacred text describes a fact, uh, it reveals a mystery. That is what the fiction writer on his lesser level hopes to do, reveal a mystery. But O'Connor's religious readers misunderstood her as well. She got a letter from a, a Catholic in Texas, and uh, she wrote, I'm a Catholic, and I can't for the life of me imagine why anybody would write about such characters. So they didn't understand what O'Connor was doing. Funny story, uh, O'Connor, when, when she published her first novel, Wise Blood, her Aunt Katie had copies sent out to parish priests all over the Southeast. She was so proud of her Catholic niece writing a Catholic novel. She was going to give it to all the priests. The problem was she hadn't read it yet. When she did read it, she got hold of the wrong horror, and she sent a uh, apology letter to each of those priests that she had sent the novel to. Even O'Connor realized what she was doing. She thought that uh, when her mom sent a copy to her 82-year-old aunt, that it would definitely kill her. Her aunt proved to be a little more resilient, uh, but she wrote to Flannery in one line in the letter, I did not like your novel. Um, so we have a misreading kind of on both sides here. 
So here's what O'Connor says about violence. She says that violence is never an end in itself. It is the extreme situation that best reveals what we are essentially. And I believe these are times when writers are more interested in what we are essentially than in the tenor of our daily lives. Think about that. Stri extreme situations best reveal what we are essentially. Right? You've probably heard stories of like near-death experiences. And after near-death experiences, people usually have a rearrangement of their values and the things that they think are important in life, right? Or if you have, if you're in a terrible situation, all of the concerns that we generally walk around with that we're worried about and stressed out about, those fall away because all of a sudden what we are essentially um, comes into play. And for O'Connor, what we are essentially was through her Catholic vision an image of God. In other people's uh, vision, what we are essentially is nothing, a, a cosmic accident. And if that were so, then violence would also be meaningless as well, right? But not for O'Connor. Her stories are hard, though. I mean, if you look at this short list here, I have two stories, or two novels and eight short stories. You see that violence, death, death, and theft are a part of each one, right? In her first novel, Enoch, a character, murders a man in a gorilla suit. Hazel runs over Solace, killing him in his car. Hazel blinds himself with lime. That sounds nice. Uh, Hazel is beat to death by a policeman. A good man is hard to find. This is a, one of her most famous stories. The misfit murders a family of five, a grandmother, a mother and father, and tragically two children. Um, and the list goes on and on and on. And at the bottom, we have the story, Revelation. Ruby Turpin gets off kind of easy. <laughs> She's tackled and attacked and choked by the character Mary Grace. And I think it's this story that gives us a picture of O'Connor's um, kind of whole vision of violence and grace um, in the best way. Sarah, uh, this is Sarah Gordon. This is one of O'Connor's friends, like a longtime scholar. She writes this question, why does O'Connor inevitably paint so bleak a world? Why are family relationships inevitably distorted, even horrible? Is O'Connor's laughter mean or cruel, always making the joke at someone else's expense? Why is there, where is the evidence of goodness and love or even the possibility for these feelings that we associate with Christian hope? And these are good questions. The first time you encounter O'Connor, you might also have these questions. Is this Christian work? So let's talk about Revelation. Um, Revelation is a story about Ruby Turpin. She wanders into a doctor's office with her husband, and she's just there in her you know, very magisterially kind of looking across the room. She's very used to getting what she wants because of the type of person she is. She's white. She's a landowner. She uh, has a little bit of money. She has good sense. She goes to church. She's the perfect kind of citizen for the, the, the South at the time. And we see how that she walks around. She's looking around the room and she's judging people according to their external facts, right? What they're, what they're wearing, what kind of shoes they have, the way that they're sitting, the way that they talk. And she really builds her entire self-identity on who she is as opposed to who all of these other people are. Um, I'm not very tech savvy. So a long time ago, I was like, how do I create a graph uh, where I can kind of show the taxonomy or the class system. And I came up with a genius idea to handwrite it, Xerox it, download it, and put it into a PowerPoint. It took me about 45 minutes. So I like to use it now because I put so much effort into it. But you can see here the classes according to Ruby Turpin. At the top, people with a lot of money and much bigger houses and much more land. Uh, and below them, home and landowners to which Ruby and Claude belong. Under them, homeowners, under them, what she calls white trash. And then under white trash, most colored people, not the kind Ruby would have been if she had been one, according to Ruby. And she would lay in bed at night kind of thinking about her place in society and how thankful she was that she wasn't one of these other types of people. Um, but she would get confused because what about the people who 
had good blood, who were from good stock, but they had lost money in the depression? Where do you put them? Where do they go? Or what about common people who somehow struck it rich after the war? Where do you put them? What about colored people who owned their homes and land just like Ruby Turpin did? What sort of category do you put them? And she said she would fall asleep at night and start dreaming. Uh, and this is O'Connor writing in the story. Usually by the time she had fallen asleep, all the classes of people were moiling and roiling around in her head. And she would dream they were all crammed in together in a big box car, in a box car being ridden off to be put in a gas oven. Obviously a vision from World War II, right? The death camps, uh, the, the Nazi death camps, putting the Jewish people into these. This was the same type of taxonomy, the same type of external qualities of judgment that maybe you could say like Nazis would do, right? They're judging people by an external part of um, who they are. We're gonna compare this dream to the later vision that um, Ruby Turpin has in the end of the story. So here, Ruby Turpin's in the office. She's she's kind of judging all these people and then enter someone called Mary Grace. And she's a college student, just like y'all. She's home from the North uh, on holiday. And she's in the doctor's office with her mother. And Ruby Turpin is used to getting a certain kind of respect from people, but Mary Grace gives her none. Uh, this is Ruby Turpin thinking, it was the ugliest face Mrs. Turpin had ever seen anyone make. And for a moment, she was certain that the girl had made it at her. She was looking at her as if she had known and disliked her all her life. All of Miss Turpin's life, it seemed too. Not just all the girl's life. My girl, I don't even know you, Miss Turpin said silently. Another great line where we can kind of see the realism at work with the sort of mystery at work. It looks as if this 19, 20 year old girl has known Ruby Turpin all of her life. This is the sensation that Ruby Turpin is getting from her. Ruby kind of continues to think, right? She's very happy to think about who she is as a person. And she says, when I think all of who I could have been besides myself and what all I got, a little everything and a good disposition besides, I just feel like shouting, Thank you, Jesus, for making me making everything the way that it is. Hashtag blessed, right? She's like living her best life and she can thank God for it because she's amazing, right? Um, this is what's going on with O'Connor. It reminds me uh, from the book of Luke, the parable of the uh, tax collector and the Pharisee. The Pharisee goes in. He's the proper, respectable dude. And he says... Thank you, God, for not making me like the rabble around me. I'm the one who knows you. I follow the law. I act properly. The tax collector who's reviled in this society goes to the temple and prays, gets to his knees, falls to his knees, says, forgive me, Lord, I am a sinner. Right? Ruby Turpin here is just like who? The Pharisee. Right? In O'Connor fashion, the next line in the book, in the story, is one of the greatest lines in all of literature. The book struck her directly over her left eye. Mary Grace had thrown a textbook across the room, hitting uh, Ruby Turpin square in the face. You can imagine, this is a fun doctor's office day, right? This is, this is good. World star material. Um, so, that, so that happens. And so Ruby Turpin's a little bit upset and traumatized. And then the girl jumps on her and starts choking her. Remember what O'Connor says here though. In my own stories, I have found that violence is strangely capable of returning my characters to reality and preparing them to accept their moment of grace. Their heads are so hard that almost nothing else will do the work. So we're gonna explore that question in a little while. So Ruby Turping, uh, is laying on the ground. She's getting choked by the girl. The girl gets poked with a needle full of Thorazine. She's about to like go out. Um, and the girl's eyes stop roiling, roiling and focus on her. They seemed a much lighter blue than before as if the door had been lightly closed behind them, it was now open to admit light and air. Mrs. Turpin leaned forward until she was looking directly into the fierce, brilliant eyes. There was no doubt in her mind that the girl did know her. 
Now she has no doubt. The girl did know her, knew her in some intense and personal way, beyond time and place and condition. What do you got to say to me? She asked her hoarsely and held her breath, waiting as for a revelation. The girl raised her head, her gaze locked with Mrs. Turpin's. Go back to hell where you came from, you little warthog, she whispered. All right. This bothers Ruby Turpin, right? You just got jumped at the doctor's office. Somebody called you a warthog from hell. She goes home. She's lying in bed thinking about this stuff. And she's the one now scowling into the distance and like stabbing her, her fist into the air. And it seems like she's now talking to not Mary Grace, but to God. She says, I am not, she said tearfully, a warthog from hell. But the denial had no force. The girl's eyes and words, even the tone of her voice, low but clear, directed only to her, brooked no repudiation. She had been singled out for the message, though there was trash in the room to whom it might have been justly applied. The message had been given to Ruby Turpin, a respectable, hardworking, church-going woman. This was who the message was for. Later on, she goes out to wash her hogs clean their pen out. These were the same hogs that she said were better than an actual human being in the doctor's office that she was uh, looking at. Uh, and she, she's angry and she's kind of yelling out into the distance. She says, go on, call me a hog. Call me a hog again from hell. Call me a warthog from hell. Put that bottom rail, remember her vision of who she thought she was, put that bottom rail on top. There will still be a top and a bottom. A garbled echo returned to her. A final surge of fury shook her, and she roared, Who do you think you are? And she's yelling at God for help. The color of everything, field and crimson sky, burned for a moment with transparent intensity. The question carried over the pasture and across the highway and the cotton field and returned to her clearly like an answer from beyond the wood. The question came back to her. Who are you? Who do you think you are? What do you base your identity on. Finally, she sees this vision of all the people that she had put in her classes, and they're going across this fiery bridge. Uh, they're wearing white robes. All of the white trash and all the people that she had been judging before looked clean to her. They're jumping around like idiots, but they're happy and they're joyful. And bringing up the back of the procession is the proper people like Ruby Turpin and Claude. And she writes that she leaned forward to observe them closer. They were marching behind the others with great dignity, accountable as they had always been for good order and common sense and respectable behavior. These are the virtues, right, that she thinks are important. They alone were on key, yet she could see by their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. So in other words, in this vision that Ruby Turpin has, the things that she thought made her good are being burned away in the end. So Connor writes that in my own stories, I have found that violence is strangely capable of returning my characters to reality. So my question is, is this accomplished in the story? Is Ruby Turpin returned in some ways from a false reality to an actual reality? How and what might that look like for a character like Ruby Turpin? Yeah. Um, while you were just describing the story, I was thinking about um, Mary Grace, uh -huh. how Ruby was judging her based on her appearance. Yeah. Um, so I had a lot of thoughts. I read that. I just found it interesting that. She said it was the ugliest face she'd ever seen, but then she called her, she called uh, Ruby Hog. Oh, I was like, maybe that's a little bit Maybe Mary Grace is the ugliest face she's ever seen. Maybe Mary is due to her own appearance or how other people see her. Mm -hmm. And Ruby's actions towards people, like where she seemed. Yeah. It's hard to put the words. Yeah, like, no, I think I know, I think I know where you're going. Like perception. Yeah. Because externally, Ruby Turpin was like the respectable citizen right mm -hmm. internally though and i think this is what mary grace is speaking to like her internal condition yeah good good
Any, any thoughts? You got anything, Alfredo? I think that the, the name of, of Mary Grace and how violence just changed the story in yeah. one moment. I yeah. think uh, it's in line with what you, uh, you were saying that violent, violence at some point changed everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. And and all and all your ideas, uh, I mean, disappear. <laughs> uh, yeah, it gets to who she is essentially, right? Exactly. And essentially, according to Mary Grace, she's a war hog from hell. Yeah. Just based on the name you said, Mary Grace is the purity of uh, the purity in the movies and the brand. Uh huh. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. And certainly the names. Yeah. Definitely the names play into it as well. Yeah. Anything from our, our Zoom gallery? Any comment? No? <laughs> okay. All right, one more question. Sarah Gordon, she says, is O'Connor's uh, laughter mean, cruel? Is it always making a joke at somebody else's expense? Where is the evidence of goodness and love, or even the possibility for these feelings. So is O'Connor cruelly laughing at Ruby Turpin? I mean, because it's easy as a reader of Ruby Turpin to say, that's not me. I would never go into a place and like look at what people were doing and judge them, right? We never do that, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly what I when you talk about um, people's reaction to her work is a different manner. Christian values and villain. Mm -hmm. I started thinking about why when people react and say, Oh, this is very dark for you. Why did they finish did they finish the book? Did they act? Why did they pick it up in the first place? Uh -huh. I just found it interesting. I don't know if that like directly answers the question, but yeah, I mean kind of creates a defensive reaction. Yeah. I mean, and of course, and it's it, you know, we're used to kind of seeing like easy answers in literature like here's the good guy here's the bad guy and ruby turpin is obviously it becomes very clear a bad person right so it's easy for us as readers to kind of like oh yeah she definitely got what was coming to her um and if you're and if you think only like that it might be that yeah o'connor's just being cruel and mean and having fun for our sakes yeah um I don't think that her loss is necessarily like mean or something. Yeah. She could just be laughing at the absurdity of Ruby's actions and that yeah. the things that she holds to such a high state of her life, and, like she foreshadows in the future, don't matter as much as she perceives them to be. Mm -hmm. And the things that she has on such low rank in reality are the things that are more valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's not a sense of like, oh, I'm laughing at your expense. It's more of like, like, you should correct these things while you have the time. Yeah. And I think that extends to what she was saying of like the sickness before death is like a grace period. Yeah. Of like, you don't always get the chance to reflect on it before you pass. Right. Because people are saying right. they just die. Yeah. And it's like, Ruby, may or may not have that option and yeah. like you may be a sense of like if you don't get that let me extend this to you yeah absolutely and it's i mean it's certain that ruby is never going to be the same again after this right she's never going to be able to like think who she is is as, as important as she once thought based on the things that she thought were important that, that's gone forever so now it's time for ruby turpin to answer that question that came back to her in the woods, who are you? Who do you think you are? Yeah, that's great. Uh, and that's that sense of sickness as being a kind of blessing, having that sense of our mortality. Um, you know, because these are things that we don't like to like to dwell on for too long. But for O'Connor, she had that death sentence over her head the entire time. She dies at the age of 39, right? 14 years, uh, very short career. All right, anything else? Yeah. Uh, how far back? Uh, it was near the beginning. It's like, I'm sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
That one. Yeah. This one? Yeah. Um, point two is really interesting to me. Um, because, in my opinion, you have to start with an emotion. Is mm -hmm. it like, is this, is this referring to like the audience reaction? Because for me, when you start learning, you have emotions that are already there. Yeah. So that one doesn't really make sense. It, well, I think what she ultimately means is if you're trying to tell a story in order to get a certain moral reaction, then it's going to work more like propaganda than actual art. But if the story is told the artistic vision as the, the first thing, then that moral vision from the creator is going to come out, if that makes sense. Like, it's not like a parable. A parable would be like created in order to get a point across, right? Very directly. But O'Connor's stories are don't work like that. And that's why they're really hard to sometimes decipher. Like, what, what, what is going on here? What are we supposed to be getting from that? Does that help answer your question? Yeah, good. All right, I got one more slide and we'll wrap up here. So O'Connor wrote to uh, a friend towards the end of her life that um, she writes, the truth does not change according to our ability to stomach it emotionally. Um, this is a great line from O'Connor here. Uh, the truth for O'Connor was the incarnation, right? This is her Catholic vision of the world, the incarnation. The fact that the God of the universe, the creator, had become a homeless Jew who was literally born in a barn, who hung out with freaks and misfits and grotesque people his entire life, said completely crazy things, ultimately gets nailed to a tree in the most violent form of death that the Romans could think of. This was the despicable naked body of Christ on the cross. That violence as a mystery to it, right, in her vision. And that's the truth that I think she invites us as readers to ask, to get hold of the right horror, not the wrong horror, not the thing that's happening over here, but the thing uh, that she sees as her ultimate reality. So I guess she gets us to ask, you know, who are you as a reader, essentially? What is essential to you? Thank you. Thank you.